Hi guys and welcome to another episode of the Burn Desire Show and today I am with uh, Jonathan Taylor who joins us from, is it Huntington Beach in California? Yes, but today I am up in Crestline, which is the mountains in California. You probably know that California has very close proximity to the desert, the sea, right, and mm. the mountains. Right. And so I'm up here now in a very foggy, uh, uh, very cold uh, cabin, uh, visiting friends and that. And I'll be up for like a week. And I was going to do filming, but it's too damned cold to film. You go outside and I go, well, you can't play the Grand Overture with frozen fingers or Bach doesn't come out well <laughs> that way. <laughs> Well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. And as I always start, I like to start from the beginning wherever we can uh, with the old Steve Jobs quote: "You can't that dots going forwards, only backwards." And great quote. Um, yeah, it's, it's my, I think it's my favorite, like of all time. Uh, oh, uh, love it, love it. Yeah, I just, I just it just it just is what it is. Um, so clearly, like you, you are you know very well known in your circles for being a classical guitarist and from what i can understand you, you taught yourself up to an age of 16 like at what sort of age did you pick up the instrument and like why like were you the sort of inquisitive child were you creative like wh why did that happen sure so you know to give you a little uh history about my grandmother she was a silent film organist and she uh worked with in that period um the teens, the 20s, the 30s, with Charlie Chaplin, uh, the Keystone Cops, uh, Harold Lloyd, Harry Houdini did many gigs wow. with Harry Houdini. Uh, I just say to my grandmother, I'd say, what was he like? She says, he was so good, Jonathan. He was so good. And uh, she's good so in what he does or as a, as a person? Both. Both. Yeah, he was a fine, he was a fine person. You know, he died. The guy, some guy went backstage and uh, Harry Houdini was known for his uh, strength and physique, you know, could get out of those chains and manipulate the locks and all that. And the guy slugged him in the stomach and he had an appendicitis and burst and that's why he died. Sepsis. I believe so. Yeah. 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 So, but it, so my grandmother was a silent film organist and think about the premieres with Lon Chaney Sr., the man of a thousand paces. Uh, this is 120 years ago, whatever. And um, you'd have to have an accompanist, right? The silent film. So she had, had a very wonderful life doing that. That was always in the background playing so you should be playing piano or whatever and uh, so i'd be absorbing that i'd be picking out tunes at four years old on ukuleles and trying to hum and sing so but then i became interested in the uh guitar really in a serious way at 10 but super serious at 16 because i made commitments at 14 um to myself which is the only commitment you can really make and, and, and so i always found this sort of thing interesting and i found this with and like I, I like inter like interviewing lots of people, but I particularly seem to find creatives, um, people like yourself. I interviewed a fellow called Dr. Andy Gotts, who's a slouch photographer. And the thing that seems to come up with creatives is this at a very early age where most people aren't even thinking about like right. commitments and putting time into something and all these sorts of things. Why do you think like you decide at such a young age to? to commit to something as you as you put it two like, reasons, that's not usual, uh, two right? reasons first of all sure two reasons first of all i say i became a man at 14 okay and uh, i had sex at 13 but what i what i mean becoming <laughs> a man is to you know, giving your mother money for the mortgage or whatever groceries and um i realized that I saw everyone with the gizmos and playing electric guitar and I played a little and that, and I realized that was kind of the low road. I don't mean that insultingly, mm. but you know, obviously the classical guitar is polyphonic Bach and very sophisticated and all that. And so I wanted to uh, not be a, a, a superficial nothing. I wanted to uh, have depth. Uh, there's uh, Einstein used to say, don't think of being successful. Think about being a valuable person, a person of value. Mm. And so 
so I wanted to accomplish this, I realized it was a very depressing moment, 14, that I couldn't, that all the gizmos and all that stuff would not make me into an artist. I had to commit and, you know, hours a day. And that's a very depressing thing at first, mm. especially when you're a kid. And then later you, they, later you, as you garner skills, as you develop um, and grow, your uh, universe expands, of course, your vision and your understanding. And so why did I do that? I think that a couple of things. I fell in love with the polyphony of the classical guitar. Saw Segovia at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, downtown LA, um, at that age time, and uh, said, my God, not only is the music beautiful, but technically what he's doing, you know, playing two things at once, three things at once, uh, it's a complete piece. He doesn't need a group. He doesn't need a background. And that to me was ultimate because the great violinist Yasha Heifetz used to say the most difficult instrument in the world to play is the violin with the exception of the classical guitar. And I wanted to uh, be on high. I wanted to accomplish something that would be difficult. It doesn't matter that it was the classic guitar. It could have been in athletics, mm. like Bruce Jenner. I guess he's not Bruce Jenner anymore. Yeah. But I mean, he was, but he was the greatest athlete of his, at the time. I mean, this guy was unbelievable. Uh, and so I wanted that, which is kind of a different desire than I want to be popular, get the girls and, you know, mm. all those things. Which is great. I mean, that's fine. But that's kind of the surface of the veneer of that. It's not delving into the intricacies of a Bach fugue. So, you, so at age 14, you're pretty much going, I want to be great at something and this thing's hard. So I'm going to be great at this hard thing. That's right. It's that simple. I mean, and certainly very difficult and not simple <laughs> because you'll find many false trails to get to your mountaintop and you'll have to go back down the mountain. Segovia used to say this all the time, that you have many trails up and then you find that that trail only goes halfway. So you have to go back down the mountain and find the right trail that's going to lead you to the peak, right, to where you're overlooking the vista of uh, accomplishment. So... Between the age when you pretend you're 14 and 16, like how much time were you spending like on, you know, six a day, six hours a day? How many hours a day? Six, maybe six, six five to six. I you know, some to days you're a kid, so, you know, you have yeah. to go to school and, you know, do that stuff. But, but like outside of that, like pretty much most of your waking hours, you are practicing. Or I'm thinking about it. Practicing is also understanding mm. it's also a mental place many runners when they run like the guy that broke the wasn't he an englishman roger bannister yes uh broke the four minute mile yes uh it was it, there is a place and at that point nobody said no nobody can do it his heart will explode you know all these bad things and of course he did do it as everyone knows and there's a spot of peace uh there's a place inside of you that everyone has Regardless of whether it's Roger Bannister or, you know, it's a classical guitarist in California. Uh, so the, the development of a person is in stages. There is no such thing. It's always drops in a bucket. It's always drops in the bucket that fulfill the bucket. It's never the big, you know, the people that win the lottery, they always lose the money. Yeah, because they don't know how to. They don't know how to invest. They don't. They want to buy like a fancy house and a big car and all the, you know, stuff like that. But that's not how real wealth is um, maintained or developed. So mm -hmm. it's always drops in a bucket. It's day by day. It's the long, slow. Uh, as um, JFK used to say when we were battling uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Union, saying uh, the twilight struggle the long twilight struggle. And I think that's true in anybody, whether it be Pablo Picasso or whether it be anybody, you know, that has done something. So it's just kind of consistency, perseverance, those sorts of. Yeah. And of course you get discouraged and you get happy and that's life. And, and so. Like, and as you get older, you get out. <laughs> or when you get older, you I want, sorry. 
I said, when you get older, you don't get discouraged or get, I can't get angry. It's hard. You know, I very rarely, I go, why? What's the point? <laughs> Anger is usually a response to feeling, feeling powerless. Mm. So that's why you become angry. So you have a place to stand and you're forceful rather than feeling helpless about something. Yes. Oh, I can't somehow accomplish this passage if I relate it to music. So as time goes on, in a way, you're not refining the music. You're refining yourself. The music is already there on the stand, right? Yes. You know, whether it's a, a Giuliani uh, a sonata, uh, it's, it, you're only refining you because it already exists. So was the process of getting better, was it literally looking at, at sheets of music and just practicing and practicing it, that kind of like endeavor, that was effectively what you were doing? Or were you writing your own things as well? Or Yeah, I was writing and I'm a composer, so I compose serious music, real music, okay? I wasn't just composing pop tunes on a guitar. I don't compose on my instrument. You never compose on the virtuoso instrument because, uh, that really, then you start getting into the proficiencies of your playing, which is not conducive to developing a theme. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Why did Western society go as far as it went? One of the forms that are in novels, that are in symphonic pieces, that are part of the consciousness of uh, Western society is exposition, development, and recapitulation. Expose the characters if it's a novel, or expose the themes if it's, let's say, a piece of music. Develop those themes and then recapitulate them because they've been somewhere and now they've come back, you know, to tell the tribe, mm -hmm. right? They've come back in an altered form. The hero's journey, as uh, Joseph Campbell would say. Uh, and all that form is all throughout Western society, in whether it be novels. Whether, regardless of the form, in engineering, in anything. So those themes uh, are ways to develop. It's not just a technical, physical process playing. It's also this. So you develop yourself. It's a self-improvement course, a meditation instrument, so to speak. Yes. And, and when I'm, I... Yeah, go ahead. I'm, Sorry. I'm curious, at this point... Do people that you were at school with, were they aware of, of how much time you were dedicating to something? Presumably, most people at that age in your school were not doing any endeavor like this. They were just being teenagers, right? So were you like a, did you, did people know or did you keep it to yourself or? People knew, people knew that. And, and uh, you know, it's not like I had some cloistered monk life. Yeah. It's, that wasn't true. On the other hand, you know, and you build up to those hours. I didn't initially start playing five hours a day, you know. And I certainly don't do that. Now I don't need to. I play a good 40 minutes maybe a day. But, mm. uh, and if I don't play a day, I don't feel right. You know, I want to. So I don't, uh, you also develop a center that most people don't have. A lot of people are searching all their lives. Oh, I don't know what I want. I've got to find myself, mm. which to me is a very ridiculous statement. I go, well, you are yourself and you'll always be yourself and that will never change. <laughs> and you don't need to find yourself. But I agree, you may need to find a direction or meaning or a purpose, a higher purpose to attach oneself to. Yes. Yeah, we talked about that just before and you had some interesting thoughts, actually, because one of the reasons that I created this um, podcast was... I think a lot of society is extremely lost in today's world. I couldn't agree more. Of course. I, I am media, totally like, on board with you. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, social media is a great uh, perpetuator of both good and bad, like anything. It's a tool. Good. Good. It's probably, a double-edged sword. Yeah. And probably more bad because of how people perceive it and use it than actually yeah. it is itself. For example, I always yeah. say this, but in with my kind of profession, which is in the luxury watch space, it's a great educational tool. I see so many things and learn so much when I go on to Instagram, for example. My Instagram is very different to what I presume most people's Instagram is like of my age, where they're just seeing people in fictitious situations and they're comparing and contrasting their lives against, right? 
So back to why this podcast, before I go off on a massive tangent, um, is I wanted to show people like yourself, provide a platform, people like yourself, people to go, you know what? Like I used to enjoy doing this, or maybe I should go have a go at this and help them along their way to kind of commit or to do something, some endeavor and help them find that purpose. And well, let me, let me speak to that issue because it's yes. a noble effort that you're doing and I fully support it. Beautiful. Uh, blessings to you. That's a wonderful and good thing. There are many lost people in the world. My recommendation is, yes, you have to reinvent the wheel sometimes. Wandering is creativity. Yes, You have to wander. On the other hand, the wheel, people know how to make the wheel. So if you study the classics in literature, Okay, if you study the world's religions, I'm not telling you to be a believer and commit to some religion you don't want to. That's not my point. Mm -hmm. My point is, to say, what are the Vedas saying? What is the meaning of the middle section of the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, where uh, Krishna uh, appears as one of Arjuna's uh, chair bearers as they're walking? I go, that story right there whether you don't have to believe in that stuff that story is very valuable why because and i'm telling this for the reason that there are people out there that are lost in their direction i go go into this you don't have to believe it don't have to fall down on your knees but it's going to add something to you and give you tools so what did arjuna arjuna is a king and he's battling his brothers and that and they're across the river that and, and they're um, going to kill each other and he's going why am I doing this why am I killing my brother-in-law my this and my that so he's asking a philosophical question and uh, what is that question why well Krishna appears in the form of a humble chariot bearer and gives him a lesson and that lesson is well it's your duty and those people won't die, they'll reincarnate. Now, whether you believe that stuff or not, that's not the point. The point is duty can turn into joy. Duty can turn into something. So there are many lessons in religion, in literature, in music. Music, I think, can heal people. And that's a sure. kind of a metaphysical concept to some people, but I actually believe that. I've seen it happen. I I've, I've, know I saved somebody's life in India because they came into my concert and they were going to kill themselves. And then because of my concert, they were my manager in New York and uh, one in Newport Beach. And uh, he said, well, I was going to kill myself. And I heard the concert and, you know, I didn't do it. So I know that it does something because that yeah. person was about to off themselves when I was playing in Bombay. I guess it's Mombasa now. Mm. And uh, so my point is this. I know that's a convoluted and far afield. But my point is that there are ways and paths and you must learn to discover them and take the plunge. Ray Bradbury used to say, jump off a cliff and build your wings on the way down. Mm. So you can't connect the dots uh, <clears throat> going forward, only backward, looking backward, as you said, it's Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs knows that that blindness, think about a water bottle. You have the water bottle. If you put it right up here, you can read it. As you move it further away from your eyes, the further it gets, you can't distinguish the characters, no matter what language is written in. Mm -hmm. And that is life. We cannot predict the future that much. A little bit. A little bit. So what is my recommendation, and to support what you're saying, is that delve into the classic literature, the classic music, the classic anything religions you don't have to uh, believe in jesus to know that the sermon on the mount is exquisite in what it's saying and to, to know that um there are beautiful passages of the sufi poets omar khayyam i'll give you a, a omar khayyam uh quote from the rubaiyat come fill the cup and in the fire of spring the winter garment of repentance fling the bird of time has but a little way to fly and lo the bird is on the wing. And the lesson is you better hurry up with life because it's fleeting. Mm. So that's maybe a long-winded answer to your inquiry. No, I think it's uh I think it's it's valid and it's interesting to see how you um how you take that yourself. Um 
back to your kind of uh, the, the linear path of your story. Mm -hmm. So what changes at age 16 where you decide, I presume, that you want to get external uh, uh, tuition, I suppose is the word for it, right? I, I external what? Say it again. Tuition, like to get to, to get better at the, the craft. You thought I need to delve outside of myself. Oh, yeah. Then you I listened to Zagobi, as I said, and is wonderful and couldn't believe he was so technically proficient as well as the beauty of the music. And really, I think as you mature, you move towards something step by step, inch by inch. You don't just jump in necessarily. It's a subtle thing. Uh, you could you may have love at first sight with a girl, but it may also take time. And you get to know each other and all of a sudden things change between you. Mm. So uh, I think the same is true with any human being. And there have been tried and true methods to, what should we say, get somewhere. The athlete knows he stretches before his uh, big game or whatever it is. And they do the running drills and they do these drills and weights and whatever. So it's all that a lot of many things have been ferreted out by other people. Mm -hmm. But you must always keep a high degree of openness is very important. A high degree of openness and to question philosophically what you yourself think. Why do I think that? I believe this. I think that. Why? I think that's very important for people that as time goes on, you realize that many of the things you believed before just either aren't true or aren't true in the way you believe them. Mm. But back to yourself, like what was yeah. it that, that led you to go? Was it just you thought, right, I've got to the level of proficiency that I can get to by my own volition. And now I want to oh, gravitate yeah. towards other people who sure. help me further. Is that what you kind well, of... Sure. I knew that I had to study with the greatest artists in the world. I studied a master class with Christopher Parkening. I was one of the chosen people. I studied for five years, private lessons at the house of the great Pe Pepe Romero of the Los Romeros or the Romeros uh, family. Uh, I studied at colleges and studied composition. So when I say about guitar, I'm, I can write for orchestra and things like that. It's much easier to write for a string quartet than it is to arrange or to um, adapt pieces for the solo classical guitar. It's much easier to uh, write a brass quintet. And people are surprised to hear that because they don't know the immense technical difficulties of the instrument. So what is it that makes it so challenging? Is it, is it trying to get so many sounds from one instrument? Is that what makes it? Yeah. Well, there's there's no pedag there's little ped pedagogy with the classical guitar with the piano. It's three hundred years or the organ, I guess, a keyboard. Uh, there's a pedagogy. I mean, uh, there are many. Mean? Sorry, that means uh, uh, methods. Methods. Wow. Uh, the Clementi sonatas and the Mika. Cosmos by Bartok are typical piano, beginning piano methods and pieces to start you at the beginning and go to the end. And uh, there isn't that much with the guitar. That's why Segovia had such an impact is there was very little repertoire and he inspired composers Rivalry, Villalobos, uh, Ponce, Manuel de Falla, lots of people. Uh, Benjamin Britten, there you go for you know, and, and Julian Brame, your own Julian Brame there in England, uh, Benjamin Britten wrote the nocturnal for him, and William Walton, the five bagatelles, um, one of which I've recorded on my uh, on my app. I have an app, and you go to Google Play if it's Android, or you go to Apple, and you just type in Jonathan Taylor, no break in the name, and it's free, free to download, free to listen to. You want to be a member? You don't have to be. It's like 40 bucks a year. It's nothing. And it, it, you can see lessons that I have up there. You can see performance videos. I have 180 performance videos and um, interviews, uh, not like this, but yeah. more like um, more like uh, I have a series called Adventures in Touring because, you know, when you tour and you step outside, something's going to happen. I have all sorts of adventures in the Amazon and in India. I toured all sorts of weird places, not just you would think Europe and America, 
uh, meaning North America. Yeah, that's the normal place. But I also toured like in the Philippines and Romania and, you know, like I said, Brazil, the Amazon, all sorts of weird places. So I I want to uh, I want to delve into that a minute then. So how, sure. how, did, that, how, how did that kind of come about the, the touring? You obviously you, you the story I guess is start at fourteen, commit to this. Two years you get very good, I would imagine, spending five six hours a day at, at certain times, at, you know, consistently. Then you start learning with the kind of greats of classical guitar and. Right. At what point did you did you decide you wanted to tour or like opportunities came around and you're like, oh, I'll go to wherever? Like what happened in that response? Well, I had a manager in Newport and then I had one in New York and they would set up gigs for me around the world. And uh, but I didn't start doing real big touring until my 30s. OK, so I, the other stuff. I was also starting to do records. I, back in those eras, it was a big whoop de doo If you had a tape or um, a vinyl album back in the um, Tower Record store and Sam Ash or something like that, and Sam Goody, these stores, I had tapes in there. And then, of course, along came CDs. And you know how it, what's happened. And then the streaming and that. And at that time, I had like one album. And I came over to Europe. It used to be under the Mark 56 label. Uh, this is way long time ago. And then came to uh, Europe and got a European record deal with the Empire Master Sound label. And from there, I toured and really came back and created a catalog. I have 325 tracks. I have 32 albums. So I spent a lot of time in the studio uh, recording many different types of pieces. And what are they? Well, I've taken the genres of music, jazz, for example. I have Duke Ellington pieces on albums. I have American folk songs. I have uh, pop songs. I have so many different things. I created a transcription of film scores, like the Bond themes, all right, from the Bond th films. And uh, film scores like The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which is on my Guitar Chronicles album, which is a Warner Brothers hit lab release. And so I transcribed many things, adapted them because of my background in composition and arranging, mm. and then created, what can I say, kind of a new repertoire. It's not that I didn't love the Spanish masterpieces or Bach or that. I loved them and I recorded all of them. They're great. But now you've done that, you see? Yes. So you have to move on. And it's not that I, when I say any of these things, it's not that I had any disdain or anything, but, you know, I'm an American. So I like American music as well. I mean, it's only natural. Mm. So I would adapt different styles and different things of music. For instance, I have taken the song, uh, uh, I had too much to dream last night by who is it? The bugs or, and it, it, so psychedelic songs and adapt them to classical time. Well, that's unheard of. And like that would sound ridiculous to some people. I go, well, and then you hear it, then you, you make your own judgment. Yes. So what we wanted to do is to change the repertoire and did that. And it was predicted 40 years ago that I would do that. It was predicted. I have a, there's a great, uh, guitarist and teacher named Frederick Node, who had a series on PBS called Playing the Guitar, a very big um, published book, uh, method book. And he predicted Jonathan Taylor will, you know, change the repertoire and become a major musical figure, all this stuff. And so, uh, and that was when I was in my 20s, studying wow. with him back in those days. Wow. Yeah. Back in, he's dead. He's passed away now. What did, I'm curious. And he was, he and Oh, sorry. Let me just finish one thing. And he and Thomas Heck were founding members. Both are dead now. Most founding members of the Guitar Foundation of America. The, I go, that's a big organization. And they were founding members. And they were both not only my teachers, but like, uh, what should we say, pushing me up all the time. So go on. I, I... It's it, at 20 years old or wherever this was when these sorts of people were telling you or predicting that you would be quite a big a big influence in in the classical guitar world like what did that do to you did that like vindicate all the time you'd spent on what you were doing because a lot of people would fall off 
the, the, that, you know, they wouldn't be able to kind of contain themselves, I guess, when they hear that kind of thing. A lot of people kind of, particularly in today's world, someone says that something like that, someone who you maybe respect in an industry, a lot of people lose their minds. And then they, 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 they kind of like could grow these egos and then they actually don't end up achieving what maybe they could. Right. Like, how did you, well, you know, like, I, never, right. I always wanted to be good <laughs> and I, uh, the accolades, that's nice. It's great. I love it. It's fine. But on the other hand, that's not why I'm doing it. Right. I'm not doing it to, uh, take my clothes off on TikTok. You know, it's, in other words, it's not that type of thing. So I just wanted to push forward. And uh, it was nice to hear complimentary things, but um, I'm not that conceited. <laughs> in other words, I don't think that uh, um, one day I will die, as everyone does, and hopefully I've made a legacy or a contribution to where music can be heard, enjoyed, and brought over to the classical music era by kind of tying in the other stuff and bringing them into the fold. You know that uh, certain people will not listen to any other than their type of music they they like, right? Yes. You know whether it's a you know a rap person or it's a, a Spanish masterpieces, whatever it is. Yes. And if you cross over, it's a vast arena here. It's a vast world. How how a lot they, of the people a lot of the people go on, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you say. No, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. With, how did you end up with um some of the more unusual uh touring destinations? Like you mentioned the Amazon and various other places that aren't usual. Look. I became a musical ambassador for the State Department, the American government. And I was called America's Musical Ambassador. And I would play at ambassadors' houses. I would do master classes and I would do um, play at the big auditoriums of the nation. Like for, for example, Barbados. Barbados meaning the Caribbean, not Barbados, Spain. And uh, so I was a American cultural specialist giving master classes, doing concerts, uh, and that, and I brought over Barbados's uh, greatest uh, flautist, um, uh, Hal Archer, and did uh, brought him over to my uh, to California, and we cut two albums. And uh, so, I uh, if you do a free concert at an ambassador's house where there's UN delegates and the glitterati of the society, you get a zillion tours, you know? Right. So, I mean, to answer your question, so one thing leads to another, right? Wasn't that guy, wasn't that uh, rappers discovered Justin Bieber or something? You know what I mean? Mm. That some rapper guy, and now, you know, Justin Bieber has a career. <laughs> so it's like that. One thing leads to another. I never knew uh, from one moment to the next, whether I was going to go to Romania or whether I was going to go to the Philippines, right? I'm just... I got you. So that I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's interesting. You you did briefly touch upon it that you were um, you. But I know you're also an early adopter of digital back in the '90s. When you say that, right. do you mean digital recording, or do you mean like CD? Yeah. Like, how do you mean by that? Well, at that time, uh, the crossover from analog was going to digital. And I knew you can never hide yourself from the era that you live in. We don't live with wigs and Baroque costumes and high boots and powder on our faces. We don't live like that. We're very modern. I'll give you an example about the, the digital. So I knew, for instance, the uh, some great violinists, like I mentioned, Yacha Hibis, he refused to record on digital because it's a cold sound in comparison to the analog. And that's true. Tinny, cold. On the other hand, my view is, doesn't matter. That's the way the direction is going. So in today's time, it's AI. So... If you don't use AI, oh, it doesn't matter. The world will pass you up. Right? AI is here. It is going to be. The company, HitLab, in which I have one album with, 
uh, uses AI to find where the listening is for people that like this type of music or that type of music. And so I'm on the cutting edge now, just like I was in back in the day of there were only analog recordings, tape. And as the transfer happened, I knew people that refused to do the digital. My response is, doesn't matter. Take the penicillin or they'll chop your leg off. You know, we didn't have it in the Civil War. And they chop the person's leg off because he's gangrenous. So take the penicillin. <laughs> so you that to me. record analog and then is there a way of like. You, if it's oh, yeah. You digitize. Yeah. Yeah. But now everybody, it's, it's so different. Back in the day, it was $300 an hour to go into a studio. I mean, it was like in the 80s, you know, the so 90s. Yeah. And, and, and that's money. Yes. Uh, and so now <laughs> you don't need that. Your iPhone has more. <laughs> you know that the iPhone, do you know that the Apollo 13 and all the Apollo missions flight basically uh, had like 10 megabytes of power <laughs> in, in, the, in the computer? Yeah. So when they had the problem, you know, the heat shield blew off and they blew this off and they had to get to the lem, otherwise they'd croak because the power was going down. They had to transfer the power from uh, the lem to the command or the command of the lem. And they tried to figure out how to do it. I go, oh, it's like five megabytes, six megabytes. Now you have in your phone more yeah. memory and power than the entire Apollo missions or any of that stuff. So look at the distance that traveled, exponential. I remember hearing uh, Gates, Bill Gates, <laughs> what was the 80s, whenever, when in 90s rather, when they were introducing the second version of Windows, the second mm -hmm. Microsoft 2, 2.0. And this, a lady said, well, this has 586 megabytes of memory. And the lady in the audience says to Bill, he's up there presenting the software. Well, what if you had a gigabyte? And Bill Gates goes, nobody would need a gigabyte. Why would you need a gigabyte? Nobody would do that. I go, well, there he is himself. You know, there he is himself. He can't see into the future. And what do you have? What do I have? Like 250 gigabytes yeah. in my iPhone? Is that what it is? <laughs> Something like that? And there are ones with way more. Yes. <laughs> well, I've yes. got the iPhone 12. I've got the 12, you know, and the... <laughs> so, you know, that's life. And it will always be that way. So whether now it's AI, and to me, AI, my view is, oh, it's the greatest upside for medicine and the greatest and darkest downside I've ever seen in history. I go, it has a dark side that it can transpire that is just unbelievably dark. Mm. Uh, but what's the upside? They can map a protein. It would take you and I to map a protein inside the human body. There's thousands of them. And you map it so you can find a treatment for a malady, you know, MS or something, cancer. And they the it takes five years to map one of those proteins. They put an AI on it. It was 20 minutes later, and he'd mapped the entire protein that took a human being five years to do. I go, right there, medical advance, it's exponential. Yes. Exponential. Uh, for medicine, wow. I know they did the same thing with Teller's equations. When he was in the Manhattan Project, and he wanted to work on the hydrogen bomb, and Oppie wanted him you know, to do his uh, work. And he would give Teller these equations and you have to work them out by hand for two weeks. And now a computer can do it just like that, right? And how do you see the AI playing out in the musical space? A lot of court dates, a lot of suing. A lot, the docket is going to be filled in the courts and the judges are going to be going, throw it out, throw it out, it's establishing precedents because you're stealing of uh, Drake, the rap artist Drake, he's already suing somebody because they took one of you know his music and they had made a Drake song, and he said that's my music, and I go absolutely it's him, it, it, you know that's uh, he owns that him and the record company. So what do I think? I think it's going to be a lot of lawsuits. 
What's you can't. The, you can't. The upside. What's um, the upside? What's the upside? Yeah, for the musical space. Like, for example, the like producers. The producers won't have to pay the artists. They can screw the artist side of the money. Isn't isn't a potential benefit that you could record with someone who's passed away, like legit? Oh sure. Oh definitely, definitely. Yes, and they'll do that. But if you get the rights, you could do that. Let's say you know, like Natalie Cole's family, Nat King Cole. I remember she did that video with her dad. It had the video in the background, and uh, you could do that with uh, whoever, right? John Lennon who's passed away, right? Mm. So, but I think you'd have to, I, I think what it's going to settle some way where you can use that under these conditions. Right. Yeah, I think that's a, there's a far bigger, bigger issue with AI in terms of, yeah, how do you, how do you utilize it for as much benefit as you can with as little downside? And that's just a very yeah, so, challenging, compl complicated compl question. So I'll give you an example of what you're talking about. So they have a, a chat, GBT or who, whichever one it was, you know, yeah. which version or that. And they'll say, write an article on um, Neil Bohr's model of the atom from what 1903 whatever it is thompson had the model before and so they'll write an article and it will be great and then they'll cite the the g the uh, ai will cite uh, that it came from this and that and you'll find out it was false that there was no book called that there was no that because it's trying to make it up and do that so but that's the state it's at now. I think it'll get to a point of refinement where mm. it will do that. Um, well, you've got to think simple, like uh, jobs where you're basically collating information and then making judgments of information, i.e. attorneys, lawyers, like where you're just citing cases, a computer's right. going to be better at that. Like once it learns to reason properly, like it can run through every single case live that's ever happened. Oh, sure. You yeah. can never even know that many cases, but it did happen sure. recently on the flip side. A lawyer did use chat GPT. I don't know if you saw this case. And um, it was a airline and the um, the person suing was saying that the uh, a trolley was pushed into them when like one of the food trolleys and like, you know, therefore mm -hmm. they, they were claiming. Mm -hmm. And so the, I think the claimants, uh, like a, attorneys use chat GPT. They didn't tell, of course, the client they did that. So they, they create this like docket. They're like, okay, here's what it is. And here's the cases. The judge goes away. Defendants goes or go away. Nobody can find these cases, as you were saying, because they were citing cases that never existed. They were just fictitious. Sure. Cases. Right. So, but it, but it, but listen, it, it will get to a point. I know, I know people who were listening to this. I would never name them that have, senior jobs that are pretty much using it to do their job like oh sure you know what i mean sure like in se senior positions in senior companies oh, oh yeah <laughs> yeah because what people, no, I don't know, people a lot of people realize like if you have a lengthy dialogue with ai and it understands the nuance of what you're doing it remembers that and then it goes yep. oh based on all this history we've had i'm suggesting this 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 now, of course, it becomes very problematic in like the therapy world. There's lots of areas where it can be very, very dangerous. But um, there's lots of areas where it'll be very good as well. Um, think about, I'll say one thing. Think about uh, when you say, what's the downside of AI? I go, well, the upside and the downside, they're both, it's always that. Yes. Uh, I love her, but she's a bad person, <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, the, there's upside and the downside robot armies so now yes. the i'll give you a story i saw one time i love how we're getting into this this is great <laughs> i love it i love it i love it so here's our robot arm. i i was watching a video one afternoon i was six months ago and um they were training putting ai in these humanoid looking robots with you know regular technicians in their lab coats with their pencils in their ears and their clipboards and they were putting ai trying to teach the humanoid looking robot how to do household tasks, mm -hmm. sweep the floor, clean the, make the bed. And they were trying to get these six 
uh, humanoid looking robots to open a can of a can opener. Right. And, you know, one robot is like halfway, you know, doesn't know what to do. And another one is doing this. So here's there's a purpose to this story. So they're training them to do household tasks. And there's six technicians in the room and six uh, humanoid robots. One of the robots sat there and or stood there and looked at the can, picked up the can and threw it at the chest of one of the technicians. Now, depending upon the speed and rate and the volume of the can, if it would have cracked the best breastbone, it would kill him, right? It, it, the impact would have stopped his heart. And it didn't. Fortunately, the guy was okay. But when somebody says to me, well, what was that? I go, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a security threat. CIA, what's the watchword? Are they capable of doing something? Mm. You and I are not capable of making an atomic bomb. We don't know how to take the, the heavy water and to get the electrons off of the uranium, plutonium-238. We don't know how. We don't have the mechanism to do that. We're not capable of that. Was that robot capable of killing a person? Absolutely. Absolutely. So to me, I see capabilities expanding in the good and the bad, both. Right, right. So, and the robot armies. Can, try to think, how can you, def you can say, oh, take the power supply out. And they go, what if it's an independent power supply? You know? so, and so there are many issues there. I saw them, I saw a robot learn how to do wheat. He had a sickle and he was uh, chopping the wheat down, you know. Harvesting the wheat. I go, get six of those. You could clean a four-mile area of wheat in a couple of days. A few, they could work through the night. Put their wheat. I saw it stacking the wheat. There's labor right there. There's labor. Who wants to do that, right? It's hard work. So the job market, just like back in the days in the when the car was invented, everyone said, you'll put the blacksmith out of work, which you did. On the other hand, look at all the jobs from the cars, right? I think, I think one of the, the famous putting people out of work quotes is all stats. I don't know exactly when this was, but when they used to be, you'd call them an elevator, we call them lifts. When you used to have a, someone who would be press the buttons, like right. that, that there were... I, I feel like I read somewhere there were like 13,000 people that used to do that job or something in sure. time. And yeah. when that was not necessary, they're like, well, you're just going to, well, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to lose all these jobs. It's like, well, right. yeah, sure. like things always move on and, and, and progress. So, right. True. Well, Rockefeller said, I want a nation of workers, which is ominous in a way. Yeah. Meaning, who are you to be programmed for this job? Right. Is that going to bring you happiness? I chose the classical guitar. Nobody put it on me. They That's can say, wasn't your grandmother a big influence? I go, my grandmother didn't care what the hell I did. Neither did my mother. And and they would have been happy if I would have been a doctor or, you know, whatever. Yes. I, I could care less. You know what? I think that's a really interesting thing you've just like kind of picked upon there with like the choice. You know, I think people often forget this in whatever they're doing, occupation, whatever, like they might say, oh, well, I've got bills to pay in this. I granted, yes, you do. But like at some point, like you chose like those things, you chose to have children that age, you chose to live in that area, you chose to get that mortgage. Like you can't keep blaming everything circumstantial, right. this, 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 like, right. you know, I think you're right. Like back to the purpose and, pa and passion and finding those things, like it's your choice. Like, it's, like for some people, like doing what I do every day, they couldn't get anything more boring. Like, you know, for some people, it's an amazing thing that I do. Same with you. They think, gosh, what a bore. So that's the horses for courses, you know? So it makes it interesting. If everyone wanted to just be a classical guitarist, it, it, would, it would be pretty boring. Right. You know? Well, I'm glad that everybody that has <laughs> such differences. It's wonderful. I Who wouldn't want the hell, you know, to be the same? I don't, the conformity. You're talking about creativity. Yes. Creativity requires great perseverance. It requires that you uh, be open to changing your direction, maybe 20 ways, mm -hmm. 20 times. 
It requires that you feel insecure. It requires that, you know, that Freud, um, his great contributions are to an analysis of dreams, it's sex, and then neurosis. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that he studied um, 19th century prostitutes in England. And he discovered something about neurosis that's really big with all of humanity. And that is this. He realized that the prostitutes were uh, dependent upon their next John for sustenance, right? For money, for their room or their food or whatever. And uh, he realized, and that's pretty much now the state of Western society. Uh, everybody's a couple paychecks away from the street. And he realized that the more you could tolerate uncertainty, you would not become neurotic. But if you could not tolerate uncertainty and you had to have things in this order in which your mind was looking at it, that you would develop a defense against that and a neurosis. And I think that's a really big thing because we don't really know where we're going. We just think we do. Yep. And we have a, a very conceited, self-centered, foolish view that we think we know what's going to happen. And that's been proven time, time and time again that People are, we don't, think of the predictions in the 60s. We'll be on Mars. You know, there's all sorts of things. Flying people with backpacks, you know, that'll be, it's the Jetsons. But mo a lot of that stuff did not come true. Some of it partly came true. Absolutely. We're going to be going back to the moon. That's true. 50 years later, I might remind well, it's, it's, you it's, know, it's, people. It's, it's very convenient to cherry pick the couple things that actually did come off and go. That's well, right. But That's like right. people forget the 99.999% of stuff that doesn't. So you may as well just throw a load of stuff. And like you've probably got sure. a prediction right. <laughs> right. Who, who predicted the internet? Who predicted the internet? Look at this. I remember back, uh, my first time I was in Europe was in the 70s. And I remember being in a phone booth a Doctor Who phone booth in England, a yeah. Doctor Who phone booth, uh, yeah. that I was in a phone booth calling back home. And, you know, the uh, transatlantic cable was what was, and it was so echoey, I could barely understand the other person. Now look at us. We can talk basically anywhere in the world, basically, 90%. Yep. And it costs us nothing. Yep. Hardly. It it is inter it is interesting. I think there's a this thing. I think there's a I can hear myself back here. I can hear myself back here. Don't know why I can hear myself in your I can hear myself back. But anyway, okay. we'll persevere. Um I have two final questions. First question sure. is in today's maybe more modern musical scene, so we're talking more people that than most people will be familiar with, who do you music to sure. listen to or or hear and go whether you like what you don't you go that's a real talent like that's a generational talent like do you see anyone right i don't now? listen to that much okay no i don't really listen in the way that other people listen because i have the music in me and i'm constantly learning pieces i'm learning the grand hoto right now it's probably the most difficult piece in classical guitar in the entire world and so I have only so much time, so I don't listen that much to music because I did it all my life. So yeah. it's different with people. I might, you know, start reading Herodotus, the histories, or, uh, you know, I'm doing a reread of um, Ovid's Metamorphosis. So in other words, I do other things. I'm interested in physics. I, take, I, I listen to the uh, Caltech lectures all the time. And... Uh, um, so, and chemistry and other things right. that I'm interested in. So I don't look at it in the same way. And when people say this person and that person, I go, okay, you know, I, I just. Is, is that, okay, maybe more wider. Do you know, like musically, are the, is the people, are the people that within your world say like this person's really like talented, like, do you know what I mean? Or even going back a little bit, like 
you know, 80s, 90s, like more of the popular people? Like, would you say, for example, yeah, Michael Jackson's like other, other people that you go like, that was a fun, like phenomenally talented person when you were- I think, I think Michael, I know the family, I know his niece. And uh, I think uh, Michael died in a very tragic way, a very unnecessary tragic way. He's a beautiful human being, a very fine and good man, uh, heavy into his uh, religion. And uh, what was it? It's, um, I'm trying to remember now. And, uh, but he was a great dancer. Everyone knows that. I love his dancing. He's wonderful and such a good person. Uh, but I'm more into trying to figure out how to adapt music that I hear. And I have to have, love that music. I have to have some connection with it to where I think that is a great piece. Yeah. You know, I love that piece. That is a great piece. So that's really where I'm at. So what's, what's the, what's the most recent sort of, that's a great piece you've heard or come across of recent stuff? Well, you know, last summer I was, well, so one is caught betwixt and between whether they're going to have a long, like 10 minute piece like I did with The Wizard of Oz, where I'm taking the film score, kind of honing it down into the classical guitar. I will say it's a medley, but not really, because it's developing themes of, the, um, of that film. And I tell uh, stories about that in when I perform concerts. I don't just um, play, I also tell background of the pieces you know, of how the film, think of it, since we're talking about Wizard of Oz, and it's on my Hit Lab release, that uh, Warner Brothers release, that um, I will tell, I will delve into stories about, you know, how uh, Margaret, uh, the witch, um, caught on fire <laughs> when she was going down the trap door a lot of people don't know that, you know, the background story of those things. Yes. So I'm more doing that. And when I listen to a piece, it has to uh, say something. It has to have a, a form that actually communicates something of value to people. That makes sense. I'll give my final, my final question for you. Is sure, that, sure. You talked a lot about kind of... Uh, AI and the future and sort of things. So where are you like now musically? Where are you trying to take things? Albeit we just talked about this, uh, only so much you can control. And like, what's the legacy that you want to leave? Well, I have my albums, my recordings. I'm trying, um, it's now time to tour again because COVID is, you know, not around. Yeah. Of course, nobody toured for like three years. Everyone knows that. I go, the Rolling Stones didn't tour. You know, yeah. I go, nothing. It's been touring. I go, do you know of anybody touring? Because I don't. You know, they're on lockdown. So um, that's what I'm doing now. I'm pursuing that and uh, getting more of my albums uh, out there with. Uh, and that's what I'm doing and arranging, you know, arranging pieces. So I'm filming all the time too. I was out in the desert in Palm Springs filming a lot. Uh, I have a lot of performance videos, a lot of filming in that on location. And location shooting is hard because the little plane will go overhead, some kid will walk by in the frame. You know, there'll be a thousand problems. I go, if you do it in the studio, it's the easiest thing in the world to do in a studio because there's no, there's nothing, right? But here all of a sudden, you know, then it starts raining, you know. <laughs> right <laughs> that's great listen it's been uh very interesting and i always say with um mm. these interviews you know you just never know where they're gonna go right so that's why i keep sure. going and as i say, the thing we're talking about ai and all these things but listen it's super interesting to get the opinion of a creative and, and to learn a bit about your story and hopefully i can share a few links and whatnot to the app and the youtube you've got and other social media as well so I thank you Great. on behalf of listeners and thank viewers you. for your time. And so, uh, hopefully it warms up a bit for you. It can't be as cold as here, but I mean. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> well, listen, have a good rest right. of the day and I will uh, I'll see you in the next one. Okay. Thank you.